All right. Today's episode of The Real Deal On is brought to you by GuidedHypnotic.com. That's GuidedHypnotic.com. Are you stressed out being swamped by anxious thoughts and trepidation? Then your free download of your anxiety-busting guided hypnotic meditation is for you at GuidedHypnotic.com. That's pretty impressive. That's, that's good, right? So here we go. Dean Miller is a 20-year veteran of the residential real estate world based on Long Island. He has been an entrepreneur in some capacity since the age of 16 when he started his first business, a mobile DJ company. Today, Dean is the owner of Dean Miller Real Estate on Long Island. He works with multiple real estate coaching companies and has become a marketing and media specialist for realtors, restaurants, and small business owners. So thank you so much, Dean. Um, you are an old and dear friend for what, 40 years, 35, uh, 40, something yeah, like that. We, wanna, we don't want to admit how long. Let's go with 35 plus and leave it at that. Okay, 35 plus. We're not going to date ourselves too much. And uh, one of the things I love about you is your continued progress, your continued ability to uh, adjust during interesting times. Uh, and this is, of course, one of them. So how, how are you doing? Tell us about what you've been doing and, and let's just unpack it all. I'm, listen, I'm doing great, enjoying life. Every day is every day is a blessing. So if you wake up in the morning and your feet touch the ground before your head does, it's a good day. You got to live it that way, regardless of what's going on around you. Uh, and I appreciate, listen, I appreciate the the mad, wild introduction and all the other all the other goofiness that goes along with it. And yeah, I've known we've known each other since uh, since our early high school days, and it's yep. uh, it's been a trip. We've we've all evolved, and I, I think that's that's a wonderful thing. And I, I appreciate you having me on your show here, uh, just to ramble and babble a little bit about what I do and who I am and what we're trying to accomplish. Amen. So, I mean, obviously, you've been through some transformations. One of the purposes of this uh, experience is to share possibility thinking and how sometimes things happen outside of our control and we have to adjust with it. And other times we consciously make decisions. So, you know, as you shared, you were a DJ. Well, it's a very different experience than getting into a, a restaurateur or uh, real estate. I, I, I look back on my life now and said, I, I, I truly believe that I'm unhireable and unemployable <laughs> right now. I, I, I make the joke every day that my, I, am, I have a jackass for a boss. He's the guy who looks at me every morning when I brush my teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the world of real estate, you know, those who survive and thrive always look at it and say, you know what, you're unemployed every morning when you wake up, you got to get out there and you got to make it happen every single day. Uh, and you look at times like now where here we are in New York, 100 days where we were shut down, we were not allowed to practice the business of real estate in most ways that we're known. Um, and in the real estate business, for the most part, what you do today pays, pays you in 60 to 90 days on average. Uh, right. If you're really good. So, you know, you've got to learn to adjust and pivot. And that's kind of been, been my life story when I look back on it. You know, I went, I went through high school. I was a, I was a surviving student. You know, I, I, I pulled out of there, which was something probably in the high 70s, real low 80s on my best day. Um, I got out of high school. I tried college multiple times. Proud to say that I'm at least a five, if not six time college dropout with no credit. <laughs> got to have goals. I am, I, you know, I am, a, I am an avid student. I love to learn, but I just never was a classroom learner. I got to get my hands on it. And I, I was telling a story to one of my kids the other day. Uh, during my DJ days, I actually went to an audio engineering school out here on the island. And, you know, a typical vocation. The five towns? No, it was called Audio Recording Technology. Artie. Yeah, Artie. Yeah. And I'll never forget my first day. We go in, there's me and five other guys, and I can't remember the guy's name, um, but he handed us a stack of binders that were all plastic wrapped together. And he had a piece of masking tape on it with everybody's each person's name on it. And he handed it to us and he says, don't, don't, don't rip it open. And I gives it to everybody. And he looks at us, he goes, okay, there you go. You now have your materials. Now put them back in the box so I can put the next set of students names on it. Cause you're never going to open these things. Up. <laughs> and I, and we were, we were in the, we were in the, in wow. the, the actual studio and he's like, all right, walk around. And we uh, in the recording room, he said, walk around. We went in and he says, there's the board. You can't break it. Just play around with it and let's go. And our first session was literally just 
playing with slides and buttons and making things happen. And he contrived, the only thing we couldn't touch was the masters because he didn't want to blow the, the monitor speakers out. Um, right. And we would have done that very quickly. And that, that was how I learned, you know, I learned how to splice reel to reel tape together with, with, uh, with, uh, with tape and a, and a razor blade. And I became a master at it. I used to do it with cassettes, believe it or not, to make mixtapes before. There you go. I really got into, into the post-production stuff a couple of years after starting the DJ business. So I've always loved working for myself and the challenge of not only being good at the, at the role of whatever the job is, but building the business around it. You know, I, I realized that marketing was an important thing when we started and we said, all right, we got to come up with a name with, with, of the company. It was me and my, my brother who was three years younger than me. Uh, and we bounced around names and it was like, at the time, this was the late eighties. It was like gold star entertainment. I'm like done sold. And we got, you know, we got the DJ jackets made and we had t-shirts and we had, <laughs> we got stationary and letterhead and we started to create a brand for ourselves. And that's a huge part of building a business. Uh, but I, I looked, you know, I did that. I worked a dozen different jobs. Uh, you know, I, I was working three jobs at the point when my kids were born because I, I when my oldest was born because I needed to pay the bills, needed medical insurance. Um, and here I am all these years later as a self-employed person paying a ridiculous amount for my medical insurance because I don't get coverage from anybody else because I am the boss. Yeah. Um, you know, so you, you hustle and you work and, you know, that side hustle mentality existed way back when. It's, it's kind of the end thing to talk about nowadays is everybody's got a side hustle to become an entrepreneur. My side right, hustle, rather than call it a second job. Right. I was going to say my side hustle was I, you know, I worked for MasterCard from seven, seven in the morning to three in the afternoon, Sunday to Thursday. So I had a job that would give me benefits from there. I would go four o'clock and I would either go to a record store where I managed it, or I'd get on a train and go to the city and work for a moving company that I did overnight shifts on, or I would do a DJ job. You know, it was like, I had three, four jobs all the time when, when I was younger, because that's what you had to do. And, you know, you mm -hmm. worked, you got on average, you got four to six hours sleep. And you know what, and you're, when you're in, your, you know, I was a real young dad. So when you're in your early twenties, it's easy to do that. Um, but then you start burning the candle at both ends and it catches up to you and we grow up and you know, your hair falls out and what's left turns gray and you do what you got to do. Um, but I, I, you know, I love it. I can't see myself doing anything else. I love investing in small businesses. I've got a couple companies that I've, that I've done passive and active investing with uh, to help them get up and running. And I love doing that. I love watching the development of people and the businesses that they have. I'm not there to develop the business. I'm there to help the people develop their own business. Amen, brother. And I hallucinate that your skill set, your ability to do so was based upon, obviously, your experience, right? So after you were doing uh, the DJ and, and multiple jobs and so forth, what was your first business beyond the DJing when you started to pivot Again. Yeah, for, you know, for, formally uh, back in '96, I was working. I was working full time for Mastercard, and I quote unquote got promoted out of the data center I was working in Lake Success, which was five minutes from my house, and I got promoted to international sales, up in purchase. Um, and I learned very quickly when I accepted that job that international sales is not a nine to five job because I got cursed at in four to six languages every day, and I had to be there to get cursed at by the people in those countries. So we in their time business, zones. Yeah, we did business with South Korea. We did business with, with almost every country in South America, with Japan, uh, all over Europe. And my days were dependent on, on which, which card. I worked in card security uh, for MasterCard. So I, if you got a credit card between the years of 90, I want to say 93 and 96, the punch and die set that made it, the hologram that, that was on it, and the mag stripe and the signature panel all crossed my desk literally hmm. every piece of it um i used to drive from purchase to rochester once a month to go do inspections up at kodak who used to make the the holograms for us it was it was a nightmare of a job it was um you know when when they hired me i had a staff of six and within six months i had a staff of me uh they they cut back and let everybody go and that's when i realized i didn't want to work for other people hmm. and i you know my story is real simple i got invited to go play golf with my uncle and a dear friend of his who just happened to be a real estate broker and i knew nothing about the business uh, and we got way too drunk on the golf course. And by hole 12, I think it was, he says, you should quit your job at MasterCard and you should come work with me. You could sell anything to anybody. And I never looked at myself as a salesperson. I still don't, you know, it's what it says on my license. And I don't say that to be demeaning. I think salesperson is one of the most noble and honorable jobs out there. I look at the founding fathers of this country and they were salespeople. Christopher mm -hmm. Columbus was a salespeople. Abraham Lincoln was a salesperson. You know, you got to sell politicians are all salespeople. Um, 
you know, so the founding fathers and the leaders of this world, religious and political and everything else, I, I look at them all as salespeople. But I never looked at myself as kind of that salesperson. You know, I'm in real estate. There's ambulance chasing attorneys. There's used car salesmen. And then there's realtors. That's literally how you line the bottom of most barrels in most people's eyes. Uh, but I look at it and say, my job is not to sell houses. I, I, I preach it almost daily. I've sold four or five houses in my entire life. They're the homes that I personally have owned. I facilitate and I create markets for homes and I provide opportunities. That's why we named our podcast Opportunity Knocks, uh, because I truly believe that every moment of every day is an opportunity for something new. Um, and you learn, you fail, you try again, you do it again, 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 you have wins and you probably have, if you're successful, you probably have 20, 30 times more losses than you do wins. Um, so how did you navigate that? Like what was your mindset going in and when did you start accepting the, that philosophy that the, the losses are as important as the wins? So I was never a great athlete as a kid. Um, I was always decent enough to make the team, but never great enough to be a star. And I, I would have to really fight to get my starting time whenever I did get it. And I've always, but I always believed in coaching. And I, I'll, I'll never forget my senior year in high school, I blew out my knee at a football camp in the summer before the school program started. Uh, and, and Coach Flatley at Gordon City High School, who just recently passed away, um, he said to me a couple days after I told him that I got hurt, he's like, well, by the time you're eligible to play, it's going to be week seven. You're not going to get a starting job and then go into the playoffs in week nine. Um, but he, he actually took me under his wing and, and kind of led me down the path of working with the coaches. And I look back on that. I never forget that first moment. And then one other moment on the field where he let me, he, I, I told him to make a call and he listened to me. Uh, and I, I, I learned then the power of coaching. It was, that was like a transformational moment for me. It sticks with me. And I tell that story every time we talk about when people say, why do you love to coach? I tell them about, I tell them about Tom Flatley. Um, and it, it really woke me up. And, you know, the minute I got into real estate, I started looking for a coach because it, there's a million of them because realtors love to spend money on anything. But I hired coach after coach after coach, and I wore them down to the point where they were no longer relevant for me because I would learn beyond the capacity of what they were willing to teach. Not that they couldn't mm. teach more, but they were smart. This is, this is the lane I live in. This is what I do. If you get really good at it and want to learn more, go to the next guy or go to someone else or just leave me. I can't help you there. Uh, and it's why I love coaching agents. Now I look at my real estate company as the broker and I tell people all the time, I am not, my, my goal is to completely remove myself from sales by the end of 2021. And if I could lose my license and still be the broker so that I couldn't do any sales activity, it would be the biggest blessing to my organization, but I'll keep the license and treat it as if I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Um, because when I get the chance to work with agents one-on-one -on -one and in small groups, we can talk about their plans that are relevant to them. Because you can't say, here's the model, go do it. Everyone's got different purpose and mission and vision and their own core values. And we hire very carefully to our company's core values, where if you get the greatest salesperson in the, in the world who can do 200 transactions in a year and they don't align with the overwhelming majority of the company's core values, they're going to destroy us and we're going to hurt them. And we just agreed not to work together. And I've had a few of those interviews, which is tough. Um, but, you know, a year or two later, both sides look at it and say it was the right move. Um, you know, when I owned my first Remax office 12, 13 years ago, we brought a guy on like that. He was one of the, one of the quote unquote, top producing agents in Nassau County. Um, but he, and he was a brilliant salesman. He was actually a part-time salesman who was also a full-time art teacher in a high school on, in Nassau County. I won't give mm. up any details than that. But he did more business than anybody. He was, he was number two, and the number two guy on the list did about 60% of his production. Um, but he, his personality was very cancerous to what the, the values of my company were at the time. Right. As a result, good agents were leaving so that the great one could be bigger, louder, take up more space. And it, it, ruined, it ruined the company, which we, uh, we eventually ended up folding. Um, you know, so you I, ended up I, folding because of that? It was no, you know what it was? It was it was the tipping point. There was okay. so many things going wrong, but that was that was kind of it was it was tapping the final nail into the coffin and then there's one more small series of events that really hammered it in there that, that mm -hmm. shut us down. But it was it was eye opening for, for me, uh, because I had a big falling out with a business partner and um 
you know, we had legal issues for years and there's still a settlement to be had that I'll never see. And I'm fine with it. I've moved on. Um, but it was, it was very eye opening to say, it, that's what led me to say, you know, that was the beginning of my journey of understanding what vision, mission, core values, mm. understanding your why was, um, you know, it was funny because Simon Sinek's book came out. I, 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 I think, I don't know if it was the book or the first TED talk he did came out. Sure. I, I was exposed to it shortly after that. I was like, son of a bitch, greatest learning experience of my life right there when it came to business. Yeah. Uh, and the initial rule was no more business partners ever. Um, that was, that was how I put my foot down. I said, that's it. No more business partners. I've come to realize you <clears throat> mistake again. Right. Uh, you know, and that actually slowed the growth of a lot of the other things I've done, but now I'm, I'm willing to partner. And, in, you know, when I say invest some of the investments that I've made in companies, it's here's money, send me a check, send me a K1 every year. Others, it's I'm an active, I'm an active participant in helping to develop websites and, and social media strategies and content creation um, and, and internal systems and management systems. Are there any businesses that you prefer over others? Like what makes you decide you're gonna be active versus passive? Um, so my, one of, one of my most successful, actually my most successful financial investment ever was a, a real estate technology company. Uh, and it started up about oh, 10, 11 years ago. And it was the, the founder of, of the company was a, was a, bless you, was a good friend of mine. Um, we bumped into each other at every conference we went to. We drank together. We went to hockey and basketball games together and we became really good friends. We still are to this day. I spoke to him uh, two or three days ago. Um, and he said, he pitched me an idea. He says, I've pitched it to seven or eight other people. And if I get enough people to say yes, I'm going to need 20 people to buy in at X. Okay. I love the idea. Everything he's ever done, every service he's ever provided for me from his companies has always helped me succeed or make money or grow in some way, shape or form. He was the first guy where I used the line, I'm not betting on the horse, I'm betting on the jockey. Whatever the product is that this guy that this guy wants to push, I've told him. I said you have un, unlimited access to to whatever funds I could provide to help you do it. Not that he needs my money anymore because he made a fortune on the last one, but that's a conversation for he and I and whoever he wants to tell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but in the beginning, it was it was constant. We were on the phone weekly, if not daily. Got an idea. This is where we're going. Here's you know, and it was a tech company, so it was hard to explain it to a guy who's not a techie. You know, right. Like, the extent of as a guy who lives in the tech world a lot of my time you know i'm not a tech person i can turn on a computer i can figure things out but, but i'm i'm a i refer to myself as a digital nomad i'm somebody who wandered into the digital world unlike my my especially my two middle kids the 24 and 25 year old they kind of were born with it and i look at my 11 year old we gave her an ipad i think she was two and she just started doing stuff and yeah I look at my parents at the same time like well if i touch it will it break <laughs> you know, kids, kids don't break things we learn how to break things you know? yeah um so i you know we we i listened a lot we talked a lot we we came up with problems that the real estate agents were having and how we could solve them in a way that the consumer would want more of it and that was one of the things that i, I learned early as well is don't do don't solve the problem of the person that's in, in this industry don't solve the problem of the realtor help the realtor solve the problem of the consumer Right. And help them understand what their problems are because we talk about all the time. There's a difference between wants and needs. Most consumers mm -hmm. are looking for what they want. They don't realize what they need. It becomes our job as quote unquote salespeople to help them want the things that they need by showing them the value of it, you know, and always leading with value. It's like, you know, part of our core values, we talk about be the guide in the process, give the best information away for free all the time. That's how you will get your opportunities to gain and get shit done. And it's that simple. Um, so when it came to, when it came to the tech investment there, I was in with them all the time. And I said, here's an idea, here's an idea. And we just brought on a few more investors to hire a few more employees. I did a couple loans for the company, which made me more money, which gave me more stock. And I was like, this is a huge win. There you uh, go. And, and when he finally, when he, he got offers to get bought out probably six, seven, eight times before he took a partnership and then sold in addition to that, um, and it was it was a it was a great win. Are you liberty to share what the company was or is? Uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a real estate tech company called Commissions Inc. Uh -huh. And what it, what it is is for the most part, it's a buyer lead generation platform that gives consumers access to real time, real world properties 
and it's got a pretty massive CRM system built into the back end of it that he developed and has been, you know, uh, my, my buddy's been gone for three, four years now. Um, since, since the buyout, he stayed a couple of years to, to head up the place and, and now he's moved on to other things. Are the end um, users uh, agents? They're either, they have two platforms. They have a broker team leader platform and then they have a, a single agent platform. And they're very similar, but as you would expect, the broker team leader one is a much more powerful pro program. Right. And they do, you know, they manage pay-per-click or, or advertising, uh, which is nothing more than online classified ads for those who don't know. Um, and, and lead generation, you know, and it's, it's a, it's an incredibly powerful platform. I still think it's one of the top two or three in the real estate industry for what they do. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I'm still a client of theirs. I'm a paying, you know, I was an investor for years and now I'm a paying client and, and still use the program. Love it. Anybody in the real estate industry has got questions about it. I'm more than happy to answer anything. I can. And it's, that's a nat nationwide service. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're one of the, they're one of the bigger platforms countrywide. They're owned by uh, Fidelity National. Uh, FNF now, uh, okay. them out. Nice. Um, and they had some partnerships before that, but yeah, it's, it, it was a great company. It was a phenomenal culture. I used to love going down. They actually built a training center at their place. They had one of these that they're down in Atlanta. They had one of these uh, office parks and they just kept taking over more and more space and they built classrooms and we used to go down there. They had a chef come in and they, they loved, they were, they were doing Facebook style employment long before it became the end thing where they had a chef there, they had a six foot high life-size Jenga game and um, right. lunch would be, well, lunch would be cooked by, by, you know, a, a restaurant quality chef every day, casual place, bullpens everywhere. It was very communal beanbag chairs. Um, and these guys, you know, you had a ton of coders and that's what they want is, you know, I'm going to sit down and go play doom for four hours. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to code for three minutes and it's going to look like I did 30 hours worth of work. Right. Well, <laughs> and that was it. And we, you know, we had kids in there that would, that were just out of high school who were doing it. Um, you know, they're right down the road from Georgia tech, but they had some, they, they, they had this one guy whose name I can't remember. <laughs> um, but he was literally right out of high school and they used to bring beer in for, they used to have beer o'clock on Thursdays and Fridays at three o'ock. And, and this one guy, he it's like mad men. Yeah. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't care, but he was like, Nope, I'm not 21. I'm not drinking. And he, he, didn't want to drink until he turned 21 old old school wow immigrant, god bless him immigrant, yeah immigrant kid came from came from uh came from uh over in asia in uh in asia um and just had his family culture and says no the rules here say i can't drink till i'm 21 therefore i will not so interesting in that mindset because when you're coding it is rules that's all it is if then if then if then that's like code and so that's why I was married. Wow. That's brilliant. What a cool analogy like, to show how you do anything is how you do everything. He was the first one to explain to me the whole, if this, then that which uh -huh. is kind of weird because for years when I worked in the data center for MasterCard, I was the guy who ran the mainframe switch and I wrote the flow charts for how the mainframe flowed for certain programs that we used. And it was nothing more than an, if this, then that mentality, mm -hmm. but I never put it together. And now when I do probably, 85, 90% of all my business planning, I do in flowchart software and then I blow it up and then I go on the whiteboard and then I put it back mm -hmm. in and I say, that's how we built. Wow. You know, it's so interesting, like the work I do in, in dealing with people's, you know, emotions or relationship, their beliefs. It's also that a normalized belief system. If, if this, then, which means it's a normalized belief system and that it's, it's beautiful. That's how our, you know, the analogy of our, our brains are like computers. That's how it shows up. And that's, you know, to, to me, that's the art of business. I think mm -hmm. when, when you can start to understand that, that all business stems from a mindset like that, you know, one or one. Or, so there was a three year stretch where I operated a restaurant. It was five and a half years that I owned it. Uh, it took us two and a half years to open it during my real estate time. Um, and we've been at it that business about three and a half years now, but, um, when I got into the restaurant business, I knew nothing about it other than how to be a good customer. Mm. And I, and I understood the customer journey because I've been studying marketing for years. You know, I, I believe that if I actually went and took all the tests, I could probably get a, a master's in marketing based on real world as opposed to what they call <laughs> Yeah. You're the, uh, Thornton Mellon of marketing. Yeah. You know, my, my <laughs> daughter who came out of college with a, a degree in public relations, marketing, communications, whole bunch of stuff and she told, tells me what they were teaching i was like you realize that marketing methods were irrelevant while you were a senior in high school 
Right. Oh, um, man. But, so I don't know if I could actually graduate from some colleges today, but I know I could probably teach a hell of a lot better than yeah, 100%. What, they're, what they're allowed to teach. But uh, again, I can go off on a tangent about my opinion yeah. of the squirrel. education system. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, the same thing. The squirrel's flying around the room. Eventually, it'll come back and hit me in the head. Um, <laughs> where, where were we? Um, Marketing, restaurant. Yeah. You were a customer. So, when I got into the, when I got into it, you know, I, I was financing the thing for my son and my nephew who both came to the realization they could not work for me or my money. Mm. Um, and one quit just before the grand opening one right after. So I jumped in and I said, shit, I got to run a restaurant. I got a ton of money invested in this and I've got 25, 30 employees who are counting on me. I can't go under tomorrow. Uh, right. Not that any of them couldn't get a job at a better place the day after, but you know, that was, that was my mindset was mm -hmm. it's my, like I say now, I don't, as a real estate broker, my, my staff, my employees, my agents don't work for me. I work for every one of them. Right. And that was the same mindset in the restaurant. That's all. That's most of my but servant leadership. Yeah. Let, let's call Brilliant. it my mature life. Let's say mm -hmm. mid thirties on maybe even 40. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's been my mentality and that's exactly it. I, you know, Claude Silver who runs HR for Vayner media here in New York city actually gave me a book titled servant leadership after I had a two hour meeting with her. Uh, it showed up at the restaurant two days later. And I, I thank her dearly for turning me on to that mindset and truly embracing it. I just, I don't like to say it about myself, but that's kind of where my head's at. Again, mm -hmm. my own personal humility issues, whatever you want to call them. Um, so yeah, in the, in the rest of, so we were talking marketing. So yeah, in the restaurant, I basically said, how, how are we going to build a place that customers not only love to come to, but love to come back to and tell people about. And I'm a database guy. You know, I worked in a, on a mainframe for, for, one of the biggest credit card companies in the world. I understood the concept of database, but I never really knew how to do it until I got about five or six years into real estate saying we started tracking everything. So before big data was the big thing, we had spreadsheets that had every conversation we ever had with anybody and we mm -hmm. could do active searches. Um, and, and it was a royal pain in the backside to figure to do it. But once database real CRM software started to develop, where it was accessible to people like me, Microsoft had a program, but it was a nightmare to use, which is why I just stuck, stuck to my spreadsheet. But once we started learning the benefits of, of putting good data in some place that can process it for us and give it back to us in a form that makes it easier for us to communicate with people, we can build an audience, we can build a following, we can connect with people. I used to love when people would come into the restaurant and I would bring up the last conversation that we had when they left. Because at the end of every night, I would take my notepad and I would spend two to three hours on the computer at home when I got home from the city, which was a good hour, hour and a half drive because we we're on the west side of town. And there was, didn't matter the time of day, there was always construction getting across town in the city. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but I would spend two to three hours almost every night taking my scribbled handwritten notes. And if you know me, I write like, I would write like a, a dyslexic third grader. Um, don't take that the wrong way as a shot at dyslexics. I know. Or third graders. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> third grade, listen, most third graders are a hell of a lot more intense, intelligent than me in so many different ways. Um, and I try, my goal in life is when we copyright is to do it at a fourth grade level, which is, yeah. is copywriting 101, which I learned the hard way many years later. Um, but I would sit down and, and take and, and put all my notes into the database so that when they made a reservation and came back, I, you know, I, I couldn't do it for everybody as they came in off the street, but we had a lot of regulars that would come in and always would make a reservation because they wanted a specific table. And I gave them that kind of Rayo's feel. Mm -hmm. When you come in, you sit here every time. So if they made a reservation, they can impress their friends. And they would come in and I'd go through my, I'd look at the reservation list for every day. And then I'd go into my notes and I'd say, oh yeah. And it would, it wasn't that it was insincere, but it would trigger the conversation. More mm -hmm. often than not, I'd remember something about it. So it was a high-end restaurant that. It was, you know what it was? It was, it was in Hell's Kitchen. It was on 10th Avenue, not 9th Avenue, where all the restaurants were. So we were more of a, a, a local neighborhood place for the people who lived there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had, you know, we had CBS studios up the block from us in one direction. We had the daily show two blocks away in the other direction, the nightly show half a block away in the other. And we had a lot of people uh, who were, who either were on stage or serviced the people on stage on Broadway. Mm. So a tremendous amount of creatives. Uh, and they lived in the area. You know, Michael Che was a, from Saturday Night Live was a regular in our place because we treated him well. Um, right. We, we had a, a lot of people like him that if you know them, you know them. But if you don't know them, you kind of know they might be popular or famous, but you don't know what for. Right. That was 
that was, you know, Sandy Kenyon from ABC used to come in all the time. I, I, I don't want to drop names, but that was kind of right. the look of people. They, they were like the middle of the road. They were just real people. Um, and, and we loved them for it. But when, you know, we wanted to make them feel special. So, and what we served was nothing more than what, what became defined as kind of elegant, gourmet, high-end pub grub. We did burgers. We did flatbreads. We did French fries with truffle oil. And you, I mean, it was mm-hmm. my, my chef and my, getting my hungry. Husband, yeah, he was, he, he was, and still is a brilliant, you know, chef he he knows his stuff inside and out and i wish him the best he's actually in the process of trying to open a place out here in comac you know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks good time not a good time to be opening a restaurant um, well you know actually speaking of that you know like let's look at sort of opportunity is it possible that now or you know within the next couple of months is a great opportunity for a restaurant considering there may be some that ended up not making it through so part of one of my new business ventures is, um, you know, I, as a real estate agent, I started a media division within my company because mm-hmm. I truly believe in the power and the leverage of all things social media and media creation. So I actually started a media division within my company. And there's only a very small handful of, of companies nationwide who actually do it in-house. Some will do it, outsource it. Others don't even know how to do it. Uh, it's still a very new part of the business. <clears throat> so we've got we've done so much of this and we use our instagram kind of as a as a as a sandbox to learn things so it's it's a very disorganized account but there's a ton my podcast is on there my real estate stuff is on there my mindset things are on there um, but we dump everything so if you want to learn about the, the madness that goes on in my mind go check out dean miller real estate on instagram uh, but we realized that there's a, a need for this so we've had people reach out to us after we started our podcast and we were four or five episodes in um, and said, hey, can you teach me how to do that? Can you help me do that? We went and bought the equipment without me knowing anything about it. And, you know, we dropped 15, 1600 bucks on it, which is a big chunk of money. But when you look at the big picture, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, and I, I now learn how to operate it. I can, you know, because I don't want to learn how to do all this tech. I'm surrounded by two, two camcorders. We've got a high-end mirrorless camera. I got lights, all this other garbage around me. I know how to throw the switch on and go. I want to do what I do. Right. Um, and that's what I hired Corey for is this is this is your job. You do this amongst other things, but you make sure that when I need to look pretty, you tell me, hey, look pretty. And then we do the best we can with what with what the good Lord blessed us with or, <laughs> or, or, or didn't uh, cursed us with. Um, but we we take the media mindset and say everything needs to build from there. Um, bring me back. Bring me back. Well, I was about opportunity. So like yeah. restaurants, like I was thinking there might be a lot of opportunity for restaurants because there might yeah. be some closing. So I've, I got a, I saw an article two or three days ago, came up through one of the New York newspapers, 17 well-known establishments in New York City have already thrown up their hands and said, we're done. Yeah. Never coming back. Um, I had two friends out here on Long Island who have been in the business, one 15 years, one 26 years. Done. Can't come back from this. Um, and they're reinventing themselves and moving on to, you know, the one guy was smart. He used to do cooking classes once a month on Sunday afternoons in the restaurant. He's going to take that show on the road and he's going to do private catering and he's going to kill it. And he's gonna, go. as he put it, he's going to have more time to go fishing and enjoy his life. Mm-hmm. And I, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm sad that, that your passion, you know, he came over here from, from, uh, uh, I think he's Egyptian. Um, 30 years ago, worked his way up the, up the ladder, and he's owned the restaurant for 23, 24 years. Ironically, right around the same time I got into real estate. I never put that together, um, hmm. but I digress. Um, but, you know, he, he, like he's, he's heartbroken over it. And why? The same reason why I struggled when I had to leave the restaurant business. I loved what we did. Mm-hmm. I don't miss anything about the business. It was the greatest learning experience of my life. It was the most expensive education I've ever had in my life, and it was the most physically challenging business I've ever had. But I miss the people. And I don't just miss the customers. I miss the people that worked with me, the ones who showed up on time and were grateful not only for the job, but were grateful for being appreciated for whatever their job was, whether it was a dishwasher or the general manager or anybody in between. I love it. And did you, um, if I recall correctly, you were opening a place on Long Island a little, a couple of years ago. And did that ever... Yeah. So the, so the goal, the goal was to uh, open a second place, one on in Hell's Kitchen and then one in Mineola here on yeah. the island. Uh, I it used to be the, Eleanor Rigby's, right? I bought the building. I bought the business. I gutted it. 
then we ran into some problems in the city. And the, the goal was we're going to operate the city while we build out the second location. I'll take I'll take some of the people from the city to come out part time to help with the development and the build out and the design and the menu and all the science behind it of Mineola. Um, I'd hire another full time person in the city to offset the hours that those people would have to contribute to Long Island. Things started to pan out. We got a new landlord in the city. Not a for New York City building department is one of the most poorly run organizations in the history of the world. My Wait, opinion. are you saying that government run agencies are ineffective and not efficient? I'm not saying anything. I'm just moving on. How's that? <laughs> uh, but so we ended up with our third landlord in five years. Landlord had to make some updates to the building to meet his own personal needs. Um, our, we took up three quarters of the building's basement, which is where our storage and service area, uh, our storage and prep areas and all the other things were. Building department came in and said, building code has changed. You have to make these changes to keep up with the new code. And I said, but I didn't make these. And we went back and forth and back and forth. It was going to end up costing me about $50,000. We shut down for a couple of weeks. Somebody came along and said, do you want to reopen or do you want to get out? And I was like, if you're willing to pay, I'm out. So we closed the doors there in, in September of, I think it was 2017. Yeah. Uh, and then while we were waiting, because I lost the hours in the city for the staff, I started to lose them for the hours out here because most of them were commuting from the city out. The management team started to fizzle and I literally had an aha moment. I'm sitting in my house one day. My daughter was, I think, eight at the time. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table and the whole world came to a, a, a massive slowdown. And she walked by the kitchen table and I watched her grow about eight or 10 inches in slow motion. And I looked at it and I said, do I want to spend 18 hours a day and two hours, three hours a day commuting um, to make gross the same amount, to, to, to make profit the same amount that I could do by going to sell a couple more houses a year if I double down on my efforts as a salesperson on the real estate side. Because I was still running systems, marketing, and management of the real estate company at, at the same time that I was running the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and my wife, you know, being the supportive one that she is, says, I will support you 100% whatever you choose to do, which was a nice way of saying, figure it out, and I got you back. Right. Uh, I wanted her to tell me to not do it. And I turned, uh -huh. around, I, said, I, I turned around and I said, you know what? I don't want to miss that. I remember when my oldest one, you know, I, I raised him until he was three or four because I worked nights at that point. Um, and I, or I was bouncing jobs and my wife at the time was, was taking care of him. So I was there with him during the day most of the time. Um, and then I went to work and he didn't see me for a couple of years. And I said, I didn't want to do that. Um, mm. This is my youngest one. She's the last of four. There's a big gap between number three and number four. She's basically being raised as an only child. And I don't want to grow up not knowing who her father is. Or right. resenting for it, which, yeah. which is a personal, personal issue I had. So I said, you know what? We're out. And I, I ended up uh, trying to get a tenant in there. I, w I really wanted to support the community and put a place and help them put somebody in place that was going to do what they wanted, which was very much in line with what we were looking to do. That didn't work out. And then all of a sudden, one guy came along and says, would you consider selling the building? And I threw a number at him and we negotiated. He was off by about 2%. And I think we settled at him being off by about a quarter of a percent from what I wanted. And if God willing, if all goes well, we'll be closing in September, October, and they'll take that building um, and put similar to what I, wa I was hoping to go in there. And the mayor's happy with what they're putting in. They're going to put a co-working space in and a, and a bar restaurant in the same space. Uh, one Beautiful. Above the other. So it becomes a win for Mineola, which was important to me because I felt like I kind of screwed him over by not opening. Um, but here we are a couple of years later, and I think something better is going to be there as a result. Of it. Beautiful. So as you're moving forward, you've obviously had marketing on your brain, right? And I remember when I, when I left working with Tony, uh, Tony Robbins, he, he was like, look, dude, remember, you are not a speaker, you are not a trainer, you are not a coach, you are not an author, you are a marketer of your coaching, speaking, training, books, etc. And it's such an interesting mindset because, you know, like you sharing, you love doing the work, you love doing the coaching, you love, you know, and same with me, like, my passion is doing the work. It's it, the all the other stuff, like I'm not a data guy like you are. So that's not my strong suit. So where do you leverage? Cause like, I don't like, how do you make that decision? Where are you going to leverage what you're going to learn, what you're going to take responsibility in application versus uh, leveraging someone? 
I, I love to learn and I've been accused of l trying to learn so much that I use it as a way to ignore actually getting some work done. Hmm. Uh, I like being the visionary. I like being a developmental guy. I like looking for new opportunities, testing and playing around with things. I like breaking shit. You know, that, that to me, that's exciting. Okay, mm -hmm. we found the break in it. Now, how do we fix that? How do we avoid having to fix it in the future? And breaking it by, by challenging it and overuse, yeah. not just going and going, hey, let's see if I can F this up. Right. No, no, no. It, it's <laughs> how, how, the, the goal is how do we, can we figure out how to get more capacity out of it? Right. You know, it's like, it's like blowing up a balloon. The more you blow it up and deflate it, the bigger it will eventually get, but the weaker it becomes. And then eventually it just blows up on you. Mm -hmm. You know, so don't do it with water, do it with air. It's a lot less, a lot less to clean yeah. up. Uh, but that's kind of my mentality. Is I, th I think about rubber bands and balloons all the time because I, I, watch, I watch them stretch and I watch the snap back and I watch them stretch. And, I watch, and that's kind of how I, I look at a lot of the things within my businesses is where can we push the envelope and see where it takes us or what opportunities it presents to us. And if it presents opportunities that are intriguing, meaning potentially profitable or growth worthy, then let's go down that path. But if there's potential for a bigger negative long-term, but a short-term win, do you want to take the short-term financial win and have to deal with the pain down the road? And, that, and that's where I like to challenge my, some of my investment partners is to say, yeah, we need money, but is it better to cheat the system and do something that may not be right for the brand in the long-term, or is it better to just go to the bank and pay a ridiculous interest rate if you have to? Mm. Um, and that's where I've had some success with people is that, okay, if money is the only, this may sound elitist and I don't mean it to, but money is, it, money is, is the solution and the cause is the cause and solution to many of the problems. Mm -hmm. If you have an unlimited budget, you have those entrepreneurs that go out and just keep trying and trying. Oh, well, I failed. You lost money. Move on to the next one. You can figure out a way to write it off. That's not that smart. And then the need for it causes people to do desperate things at times as well. Right. Which is why you find some entrepreneurs paying 18, 22, 35, 40% interest on whatever kind of creative loans they got to go get. So I, I, like, I like to, it's part of my investment strategy is to always make sure that you've got enough rolling that you can contribute somewhere else when the right opportunity comes up. So, you know, like, like with Commissions Inc., they wanted to hire more people. They didn't have it in the bankroll. I, I just happened to have some money at the time. I said, what do you need? I said, boom, I'll write you a check for the whole thing if we can come up with the right terms. I couldn't, for legal reasons, the, the, the board didn't want one person, that one, didn't want the company beholden to one person, so they made me split it, and we found another investor, and boom, they gave me a 14%, you know, I really probably shouldn't discuss that part, but I already said it. They gave me a 14% return on my investment, and they gave me additional stock options. Like, yeah, let's do it. So when the six months was over, they said, can we do it again? I'm like, yeah, let's do it every six months. Well, and well, I, I, yeah, and I thank you for sharing some of the data because I think sometimes people don't understand also the risk involved and, and they're not willing to be creative and they get overwhelmed, right? So like as a real estate investor, for me, like I try and keep things at a 10 cap or better and you know, that's just my thing. Some people are willing to do much less. Some people have a much higher threshold, and they have different, uh, but where, where they're willing to go higher or lower, they're, they're going to make those adjustments accordingly. Right. Uh, and that's, that's the beauty of it. So the 10 cap is kind of the rough number that most investors look at. Some will go 12, some will go eight. Where are they giving up or gaining on the other side? You got to understand that there's balance with everything. Well, it's and, never, never black and white. Oh, yeah, well, and that's the thing I think often, and, I, and I, it, it's so interesting as complex and complicated of a world we live in, all too often, people are looking for the the easy fix, the one stop fix, and not willing to, you know, understand that there's going to be that ebb and flow of strategy and and um, time and and all of that. Because I remember I was talking to a guy um, who does bigger investing and you know like does big construction and is you know doing stuff in the millions. And uh, there was an opportunity where someone said, oh, you know, they'll do it for you know uh, they're doing a loan for you know it's like thirty percent. And he's like, I'll take that all day. All day. Yeah. All day. And other people are like, oh. and he's like, do you know that my other option is 50%? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, wow, depending on the game you're playing at, that 50% is worth it. Rather have 50% of a million dollar deal, right? Than no percent of no deal. But then go, if I could do it for 30, that's even better. 
it's one of the reasons why I, I, in my own head, I have struggles with business is because everyone says you got to set a goal. And when most people talk about goals, they're talking about something very well defined and specific. And to me, like I just said to you, it's not black or white. I love living in the gray because I love the journey and the process because for me, the goal is to continue to grow and evolve and improve and get better. You know, one of my favorite lines that I say, I don't get out of bed in the morning. I get out of bed in the morning to make it. And when I do that well, the dollars that I need automatically find me as a result. And I truly believe that for me. So Say that, that again, because I think it broke up a little bit. I, we, I, don't, I don't get out of bed in the morning to make a dollar. I get uh -huh. out of bed in the morning to make a difference. Got it. And when I, when I do that well, the dollars that I need find me. Mm. Because by making a difference, I've earned one. And a big part of, so to me, it's all about that journey. The things that are, that are black in me is I've got numbers that I want to give away to charity. I've got numbers that I want to invest. I've got numbers that I want to contribute to my family. Those are, those are black and white. But again, they're only black and white because I set a minimum. Every day I right. get better. That number will grow incrementally with it. Um, so can you share a little bit on that? Because I think there are a lot of people out there who sometimes, very often, especially, you know, warm, caring, you know, the coaches, the speakers and all that. Um, and even I'm sure some people in, in real estate, they don't know how to get to the mindset, how to monetize where they're trying to make a difference all the time. But then there's, they, they, they don't find a way, like they feel like if they're charging for it, then that takes away from making a difference. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I was on a, Corey, my media director and I, we were on a call with a group last night and Corey recommended to uh, somebody who was looking to hire somebody like him. He said, and his take, he, now he's 24. He's, he's, you know, I'm, I'm going on 51. So he's half my age plus, uh, but he's really intelligent guy and is, is a lot more business savvy than I realized when I brought him on board. But he, he said to somebody in the group last night, if they're not willing as a, as a creative, as a videographer, editor, photographer type, if they're not willing to do some work for you for free, don't even bother giving them a second, a second, uh, a second call. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the group snapped and said, you know, it's not right. Would you, would your accountant do work for free to prove that he's a good accountant? And it, it became kind of politically ugly in there for a few minutes. And Corey started texting me directly and we had a good laugh at, at that other person's opinion and expense. And I said, you know, some people look at it as being elitist and, and it's, it's like, sorry about that. I thought I turned that off. Um, you know, I, I, I think people like you, you got to look at people like that and say, Hey, there, there are opportunities out there and to, to highlight and show off who you are. You know, I, I, I pay Corey a decent salary. He's comfortable with it. It's a number he threw it through at me uh, to get the work out of him to hire on a contract basis would probably cost me four to five times that amount. He's mm -hmm. a creative. He, he create, he craves consistency. And as someone who studies personality profiling for 20 plus years, and it doesn't use it to manipulate, uses it to benefit. I said, what is it that's most important to you? Terrific. I can give you that. What do you need? What do you need? Terrific. I can give you that. Let's do it. Um, uh, you personality profile, you're talking about disc or one yeah. of those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, tr I tried the, uh, what's the other one? Briggs? Yeah. Something Briggs? Yeah. But, but the, uh, the, the disc one was the easiest one for me to yeah, learn. Yeah, it's the most fundamental. Yeah, it's just basic. You only got four quadrants. Keep it easy. And, and that's what it was. Is I, I can't, when I first learned it, when I went back. Myers and Briggs is all the, you know, the ENJ. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. Uh, that's exactly Heidi right. loves that and, stuff. And and back, and, uh, yeah, I went back the second time to, uh, to a coaching program, to their second annual seminar, uh, and embraced it. And I came home with like 20 copies of the sheets. And I gave them to everybody I knew who I was close to. And I figured out who was a D, who was an I, who was an S, who was a C. And mm -hmm. for the rest of my life, every time I have a conversation with someone, I say, which one of these four people are they most like? That's how I'm going to talk to them. Because most mm -hmm. likely, that's how they're going to want to be spoken to. Yep. Know, it, I, I learned to become a chameleon with it. Not a fraud, but I learned to adjust my own my own. Oh, yeah. No, I, I teach it as a, definitely as it's a huge communication. So it's just improved communications. Understand where they where they are at. That's it. You know, you, you don't, you don't sell to people, you, you sell to people the way they want to be sold to and you never have to sell. Right. You, know, you give them, you give them what they need and what they, you help them understand what they need. You give them what they want. Uh, and, and you let them, it's like I said, I don't sell houses. I, I create opportunities to buy and or sell. So how big is your team now? 
we're we're just getting back into recruiting mode. So there's there's myself and Corey who are in the office. I've got four salespeople who are out of the office. We are in the process of interviewing for uh, inside sales, um, probably between 30 and 60 hours a week. So one to two people. Um, we are looking to bring on. Um, I, I'll I'll call it an executive administrative type person. Um, to get a lot of my mess. I have a lot, most of my high, most of my, my team is outsourced. So they're task managers. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to start to consolidate. And really my goal is to bring on a chief operating officer of the company within the next 12 months uh, so that I can move more into that. Let's, let's grow to become not just a local, uh, a local powerhouse, but a somewhat regional powerhouse. So right now, when you say local, you're Nassau County or? Well, yeah, the overwhelming majority of our business is central and southern Nassau County on Long Island. Um, you know, we, we are in the Hamptons from time to time. I was in the city for a couple couple deals last year. I've officially ended that run. Um, I, but I, and I did that because I built a very good referral network. Mm -hmm. and that referral network is, and everybody who's in it knows the goal of me referring business to them is to eventually bring them on board on our team. And they all watch every move that we make. And I, I know there are a couple that'll join us this year. And it was just, here's what we do. Watch what we do. I'll explain to you why it would be a benefit to you. And I'm watching, you know, I, I saw a good friend of mine who just moved companies who is, the, we're, we're good friends. We're not a good fit to work together. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, she goes, I'm surprised you never made the offer. And I said, well, we, we have made the offer in conversation, but we've also come to agreement that we're better off working for separate companies. You, you working for a different company, not mine. Because right. I can provide the value to you that's most important to you. So moving forward as you're growing, what do you see as like the next phase or the next disruptor, the next way? Like how do you think the real estate business is going to transform? It's a tough call because, you know, right now, so I guess I, so the conversation, last conversation I had about this is I feel like, the entire market is in the starting gates at the racetrack. Mm -hmm. But now that we're in the gate and we got pushed up against the opening gate and the closing gate got closed behind us. Now all of a sudden we closed our eyes and we're dizzy and we don't know which way we're going. Mm. Those, when either of those gates open, there's going to be a massive explosion and it's going to be frantic behavior. And I say this specifically for my market here, because typically this time of year, most people who are looking to make a move for a school year are real close to being in contract and going through their mortgage process. Right. You know, this, the spring leads to the summer buyer. So most of the summer buyers who are going to close prior to, to uh, September when school starts, they're not going to have the summer in the house. They're going to have a couple days or weeks before August to unpack, move in and get their kids off to school. And I'll admit it. We spend most of our energy this time of year looking for those clients who, who have a need because of a school. Right. Um, but well, I also a, see a tremendous amount of people. Yeah. I, I see a tremendous amount of people making the mass exodus from New York city mm -hmm. uh, because more and more companies are going to allow their employees to work remotely. There are going to be those who say, I'm going to work remotely, but I'm only going to be a 45 minute train right away. Well, guess whose train station is 45 minutes from Penn station. That's me. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, Mineola, Wanto, you yeah. know, if you go in central or South shore. Uh, so I, I think there's opportunities. We've, we did a good job during the shutdown of monitoring the activity on our websites. And we saw an almost 400% increase in web traffic uh, to, our, to our search sites. And we saw almost a three times increase in actual inquiries from people saying, please call me or answer this question for me. Hmm. So technically we were not allowed to do any cold calling the minute that the that the shutdown started, which right. I don't have but you could return with. calls of interest. I don't, I have not made a cold call in probably 16, 17 years. Okay. Everybody I call has given me their name, their email address and their phone number. Yeah. Willing. Now many of them have given me the wrong ones and I've got a lot of Mickey mouses and Donald ducks <laughs> and views in there, which I'm fine with. Yeah. Um, but you know, so we picked up the phone and it was mind blowing. I used to, I used to, when I worked the dialer consistently, uh, I would probably make between 30 and $40 an hour. And I was manually dialing and I was making three or four dials an hour because I was having conversations that were lasting between 12 and 20 minutes. Wow. People just wanted to talk. And when yeah. they start talking, 
you know, listen, I'm an, I'm an ear. That, I'm okay. That, that's when your eye comes out. Right. You want to talk about your crazy Aunt Sally? Boom. Go ahead. What can I do to help? Don't. And I, I've been said to one guy, I said, you, you're getting personal. Do you really want me to know this about your wife? And he started, <laughs> and he started laughing. And he, they reached out to me because they were looking in a specific area. Yeah. So I said, I'm only, you know, the main reason I was calling is to make sure that what we're sending you meets your needs. Right. If you do have a need to buy. I want to make sure we're sending you what you need. If you're looking at real estate pornography, as we refer to it all too often, the HGTV and DIY mm -hmm. people, hey, look at whatever you want. But if there is the possibility of a need, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're serving you properly. And this guy not only told me about where he wanted to go, why he wanted to be there to be around his kids and his grandkids, why his wife is still working as a nurse, how long ago he retired. Uh, and oh, by the way, here's my home address. Any chance you could tell me what you think it's going to be worth at the end of this year? Oh, listen, that's where the salesperson to me says, not only can I tell you, I'll put the report together. I'll get one of my guys who's in the neighborhood yep. to take some serious shots for me. We'll put together a real report and we'll give you the entire soup to nuts presentation over the course of the next three months so that when you're ready to go, you literally just have to pack your stuff and hand me the keys. And just say, and yeah, green light it. And, and this guy basically said to me, I'd sign the paperwork today to work with you. I said, well, the problem with that is the board will probably find me a million times because I'm not allowed to show it. So let's hold off until <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, but so getting back to it, where do I see the market going? Interest rates are still ridiculously low. I truly believe that the recession is going to get, is going to get worse before it gets better, mm -hmm. especially with all the, all the, the fallout we have. I was, I was pleasantly blown away with the unemployment report that came out the other day. They were expecting it to be mass hysteria. It was, it was minuscule compared to what the media had been reporting, which is why I tell people all the time. Get off hyper the news. Local, hyper local, get off the news and find someone who's local who can provide you real numbers. Uh, and don't wait for the Fed for the feds to come out and tell you what their reports are. Whether they're right or wrong, you're waiting too long for them. You can find most yeah. of this information. Um, it, it blows my mind. You know, we, we, we have ads out on all the platforms right now for people, and we're getting blown away with, with resumes from not only people who are unemployed, but people who want to reinvent themselves. And yeah. I love it. Creating a tremendous Beautiful. amount of work for me. But I like doing that because, again, I'm creating opportunities for people. and That's what I want to do. Um, I'm a big believer in that whole Richard Branson line, teach them so well that they can leave you, treat them so well that they never want to. Right. Um, it's one of my favorites. So I, I see the recession having an impact on the economy, uh, but interest rates can't get much lower. And the Fed's already said multiple times they're not going to they're not they're not going to be able to blow them out, go in the other direction. There's no need for that. Um, and if you look at historically most recessions, real estate still does appreciate during a recession. Mm -hmm. It's probably at a 50% rate of what it typically would be going at. So if, if real estate were, were appreciating, let's just make the numbers easy for me so I can do the math. If real estate were appreciating it at 10% a year annually, during the recession, it would probably appreciate somewhere around 5%. Right. And if you look at the numbers historically, that's not that inaccurate. Um, so I do not see a real estate bubble, which many people have talked about. Um, I think where there's going to be potential problems is with the whole landlord rent issues, yep. especially with those tenants who are either unable to or unwilling to pay the rent. Um, once evictions are allowed, you know, it, my, my heart breaks for some of these people on both the landlord and the tenant side. Yeah. Because people look at the landlord and say the landlord's the bad guy. Well, that's, that's the landlord's business and he's, yeah. entitled, the, the, he's entitled to make a profit as well. Well, it's not even a profit. If you're not paying, yeah. you're losing. That's, but that's my point. Yeah. yeah. People get angry at corporations and at landlords and say, oh, they're all just these greedy people. Uh, listen, as a landlord, as a landlord I'm, I'm going to buy, I'm down to now purchasing my only investment property. I'm selling, once I sell that Mineola building, I'm out of everything. I'm going to buy a 300 and something thousand dollar house in, in Levittown here. I've got a tenant lined up for it. It'll be, my only, it'll be my only one. But the minute I buy it, it becomes an expense to me. And once I put the tenant in there, I've still got to pay off and get that money back. And what, you know, there, there's a lot of risk that I'm taking. Oh, on. it's such a small margin. That's why, you know, I mean, Minimal yeah. Margin. It's the same reason why I tell people nobody should be allowed to complain in a restaurant unless something's really screwed up intentionally because the margins in the restaurant business are oh, so crazy. Big. Expecting a free drink because they seated you four minutes after your reservation time <laughs> is going to break that restaurant. So don't do yeah. that, people. Amen. Um, I'm, I'm very much in the foodie world. So I got a lot of, I got a lot of gripes with the food. No, I, I get it. Well, listen, brother, I would love to chat longer. We have a, a, a thing coming up, but um, how can people get in touch with you to do more, to learn more about you, connect with you and, and perhaps I, even do more I business? Am, 
Yeah, I am currently in love with Instagram. Uh, I've, I've been there forever, but it's the one that I'm playing. It's, it's the sandbox I'm playing around in the most. So uh, my personal accounts on Facebook and Instagram are both at Dean Miller. Uh, my real estate company accounts on both are at Dean Miller Real Estate. We've got a few other projects in the works. Uh, we're going to be launching a website that is meet the, it's all about Dean Miller Incorporated, all the businesses I have. But come follow me. The easiest place is follow me on Instagram at Dean Miller Real Estate. Um, I answer my own DMs. I do all my own my own engagement. It is all me all the time. Um, Beautiful. And I love it. Awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I look forward to seeing you next time we're up there. And of course, as you know, uh, open door policy here. You're welcome anytime. And we've got some family down here. So we look forward to allowed, seeing you. As soon as I'm allowed back on a plane to come see dad up in Jupiter, I'm, shoot, I'm telling him I'm disappearing for a day to go see you and grab some lunch oh. and a couple of cocktails. Awesome, brother. Well, I love you for who you are and who you aren't. And uh, God bless you for all you do. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Doug. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And I appreciate it. And like I said, if there's anybody in your audience who I could ever be of any service to, please feel free to reach out. Oh, God bless you, brother. We'll see you soon. Have a great day. Right, peace.